everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our insight of the burning bush, the fire of God's presence. This is your pastor, Yeti. Today I'm going to talk about Elijah and the fire. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. 1 Kings 18.21 Let us pray first. Father, we pray that the Spirit of God, your Spirit, the Spirit of the Father and the Son may take this ancient truth and let it be released in power over our conscience. Lord, we haven't long and we are in great need, so beseech you. O risen Lord Jesus, confirm your word. Confirm your word and perform a counsel of your messengers. Amen. This chapter covers a low period in Israel's history when the nation should have been committed to the highest righteousness in personal living and conduct and the purest worship of the Most High God. In spite of God's covenant and His given of the law and privileges, their lives demonstrated a continually and constant controversy going on between them and God. The chief blame belonged to someone I call the Sidonian vampire Jezebel. Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. He wasn't much of a king, really, but he killed the place for a time. I mean, he filled the place for the time. Excuse me. His wife was not Jewish. She was the daughter of the king of Sidon, and thus she was a Sidonian and a Baalite, someone who worshipped Baal. Ahab was a Jew and was supposed to be a worshipper of Jehovah, the great God. The I am that I am. Even though the Baalites were set against the Most High God, Ahab apparently wanted a wife from the royal family of Sidon, so he picked this good-looking Jezebel and married her. The worship of Baal involved cruel and immoral rituals, and Jezebel was the evangelist of the hour. Not for Jehovah or decency and righteousness, but for Baal and evil. All this led to a moral dilemma for Israel. Here was a royal family, a Hebrew with his wife, a Sidonian. The king was committed, at least nominally, to the worship of Jehovah, and his queen was committed positively to the worship of Baal. This reminds me of a passage of scripture that is very mysterious. There's much to say about it that I must say it may lead to being accused of being a mystic. The verse John 1, 9 says, Christ was the true light, giving light to every man that comes into the world. So even the man or woman who has never heard of the Bible, God or the Gospel, nor anything having to do with revealed religion, still has more light than we imagine. For every person has been, in some measure, illuminated by the true light. So, 
that they know something of what is right and wrong. If you're worrying about crooked politicians and movie actresses with five husbands, change it around and thank God for the people, for the good people you know. Sometimes when you're feeling real mean, when you just feel emotional as if you were not a Christian at all, your faith is holding and you really do know who you are. Your anchor holds in the storms of life. But if there are times when nothing seems right, get down on your knees and then on a piece of paper write down the names of the good people you know. Be grateful to God for the ability to appreciate them. Israel should have known right and wrong by the deep wisdom that lights up every man. God's people also had access to divine revelation the Holy Scriptures, which nobody else had, even though they should have known what was right, who to worship, how they should live, and Jezebel set the standard for morality and worship. However, she chose to dress and live. Others followed her ways. They also worshipped the way she worshipped, because the people were too weak and cowardly to obey God, and they found it easier to follow what was in vogue. That's always the easiest thing. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to learn to stand against what's in vogue. You're going to have to learn to listen to the voice of God and heed the sound of an inaudible drum. There are people marching all together in another parade and a world marching to the world's music is going the wrong direction. We're going to have to decide whether this religious business is of God, whether God's in this, whether the Bible is real, whether hell is hell and heaven is heaven, or whether we can just follow what's in vogue and be like everybody else you're going to have to make up your mind. As I said, Israel was in a dilemma and, of course, nobody's at rest when they're in that condition. Because deep down people know when they are following a band or parade that isn't going to happen. They know they're being cheated, robbed of something very precious, and it worries them. A man knows he has dishonored his soul and he is deeply ashamed until he covers it up with amusements. He knows he is violating the holy laws of God and it makes him afraid, but of course the effect will depend upon the degree of light. Will we worship Baal or Jehovah? If Baal, 1 Kings 18.21 applies, how long will you falter between two opinions. I say that the religion of our day is the religion of Baal. It is a religion that will let you get away with anything. If you just talk about love and the unity of mankind and the brotherhood of the world, if you just talk nice and sound pious, you can do just about anything. The sky's the limit. And there's no morality no righteousness, no God lines required. Just live any way you want, provided that in the end you say, well, we're all going the same way. We're, going, we're just going by different roads. It sounds so very spiritual, but it's just the way the Bilite lady Jezebel talked. She told them, now, your Jews, don't you know that Baal has something to be said in his favor too? Of course, they have six orgies and rites of inequity to worship him. But that's all right. That's our way of looking at things. What does Baal offer? What does the chief shallow religious world offer? They offer a few things. They offer 
the customary fun and conformity. If you do it, if you conform and go along with the crowd, they had to have it. But Jehovah, he called you to good, hard way. The good, hard way, with his present cost and his eternal compensation. What has Baal to offer? What has the world to offer? Will we surrender to the world? What has it really to offer it? It would lead you to think it has a great deal to offer, but how utterly helpless it is when tragedy strikes. A trimmed down gospel never saved a soul. A trimmed down deluded edited religion is not the religion that Christ died to establish. And the heaven over yonder is not filled full of weaklings who had to have somebody to go along and help them over the rough spots. It is full of people, soldiers, and the martyr, and the dreamer, and the prophet, and the rule followers. We uh, who love God and love their generation and lived and died having lived a good life, a hard life, we've got to make up our minds. Are we going to go the way the world goes? Jezebel will see to that. What are we going to do about it? Baal has a lot to offer. We might as well admit it. If heart, the preachers talk about how burdened down men are with sin, picturing them with great weights on their backs, and preachers say there's no pleasure in sin. Of course, sin has pleasures, but you've got to break with it and follow Jehovah. The worse the country is, the worse the state of society, the harder it is to break, and the more it's going to cost you to break from sin's pleasure. Make up your mind. Don't be in the middle because you're neither or not hot, cold or hot. God will spew you out of his mouth. The only place in the Bible where God gets sick is when he faces up to people who can't make up their mind about whether to serve God or Baal. I believe that God has more respect for by lights down on their knees before a sex altar than he does for the fellow caught in the middle who is afraid to worship God, trembling in the middle between right and wrong. Does that describe you? God says it makes him sick and he spews you out of his mouth. If Jehovah is God and Jesus Christ did indeed say, come and take up your cross and follow me, there will be a judgment. God is to judge every person's heart according to their thoughts and according to their deeds. With Baal, you've had your fun, but the day is coming to take your medicine. Every time you let astray, remember the person that leads you astray really leaves you in the lure, in the lurch. When Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, Judas was deserted by the people to whom he had sold Christ. With a spasm of conscience, Judas went back to the priest and said, Here, take the money. But they turned coldly away and said, What is that to us? It's always like that. People will lead you astray and then leave you in the end. But thank God for the one named Jesus, who leads us on the right path and never leaves us. The Baalites had their fun, or they couldn't be cleansed inside. You're going to die someday, and I trust you want to die with a and I trust you want to die with a clean conscience. How do you do that? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. So if Baal is your God, serve him. Will he never forgive your sins? Never cleanse you within. Want somebody who can direct you and lead you through that cleansing process? Baal can't do it. Baal can have a big time Saturday night. 
but he will leave you with a frightful hangover Sunday morning. But I just can't help you through in the end. If you choose Baal, if you choose anything other than the true God, you go without a counselor and advocate. If you choose Baal, you go without anybody to direct your life. If you choose the world, you go without cleansing and forgiving. Our story in 1 Kings 18 ends with Baalites calling out to their God, but no answer came. They prayed all day and cut themselves all day, but still nothing happened. Then Elijah prayed to the Most High God, and in no time fire came down. God confirmed Elijah's faith and gave witness to his obedience. And that's what God will do for you. This is a hard lesson to hear. I think it probably comes hard on. But I believe that the Word of God as well can be a balm, a balsam on your heart, but also a sharp sword which which will divide what is from God and not, and that you face it. So this lesson that we just heard is about that. Where are we? Are we worshiping the living God? As Jesus was giving the examples to his disciples, but also the people around him, unto the scribes, who do you serve? Is it God of Mammon, the money God, the world? And hear me out, I'm not saying that you cannot have money, that you cannot be rich. It is the way you live with it. It's about a worship, an adoration of the Most High God in your life. What is your life? How do you live? May the words of the verse of the book of Kings be a lesson to us. And may the word of God open our hearts and may it be like a two-edged sword that divides so that all the good that can be our life be a living sacrifice in God's hands. God bless. And may God protect you. May God protect you with the guidance of His Holy Spirit where you live and your family. May He give you the wisdom and insight if you make decisions and may it be the right decisions. Hold on to God. It's the best thing that ever can happen to a human's life. For those who are listening and doubting or not even being a Christian, just curious, the living God is the creator of this world. And he sent his son and the son of God was obedient to God. And he died, but he finished the work for you and for me. So there is an entrance in the kingdom of God. 
as you open and give your heart and your life to Christ. God will not abandon you as you come to Him. God bless. And may the peace of God be with you and in you. Bye.